Good morning, everyone. How are you guys today? Good to hear. Uh, it's snowing outside, which makes me feel comfortable because I'm from Canada and uh, we got snow all the time these days. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how water is more important than oil. And I'm going to start off showing you that water, the water crisis is one of our biggest crises we're facing uh, today. That each of us consumes 2,100 gallons of water every day. And I'm going to show you how you can save 250 to 500,000 gallons a year yourself just by making some small changes. Now, Stephen's uh, given a little bit of an introduction about uh, me. So I did have a corporate career before I got into journalism, and that's downtown Toronto in the winter. It looks nice, but it's pretty cold uh, this time. So my midlife crisis came as a result of uh, my corporate, uh, well, the members of the board of the company I work for, suggesting that they didn't need my services anymore. And so that afforded me an opportunity to make a decision about what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And some of the things I knew I liked weren't in the corporate world. I liked to be outside. I liked to learn new things. I liked science. Um, and I liked environmental issues. You know, had become more important to me. I had taken journalism in college, so I did have that. So I thought, OK. Why can't I do the kinds of things I want to do and bring uh, things that I think that are important to other people? So a few years later, it's quite a struggle to be a freelance uh, journalist. So I've been doing it for 25 years. And these are, these are the people I write for right now. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, you know, make a career of it, because many people can't as a full-time profession. That led to um, the book. And Stephen's right, it took a heck of a lot of math, not my strong suit, um, and a lot of research. So before I talk about what your water foot really is, I want to talk about rhinos. So a few years ago, uh, I was on assignment in South Africa, and I was with a couple of trackers, you know, walking through the bush in the Kruger National Park, and we were looking for rhinos. Um, so rhinos are, you know, they're pretty big, and you're walking, and the guys got guns because they can charge, so they're unpredictable. Uh, so finally, we're tranching through the bush for an hour or so, and they say, okay, look over there. There's a pair of rhinos. And I go, uh, I don't see anything. I just see more, more bush. I said, OK, we'll get a little bit closer. So we got closer. And they said, see, they're a mother and her baby. And I had to say, yeah, I don't see anything but more bush. Now, this was getting a little bit embarrassing because I'd already been bragging about all day how I'm such an outdoors guy up in Canada. Uh, you know, I can spot the deer and the coyotes and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> they said, well, we can get a little bit closer, but, you know, it's going to get, you know, we're, it's, it's riskier. And we certainly don't want to have to shoot at the animals. I said, well okay, well, okay, let's be careful and let's get a little bit closer. So we got a little closer, and I still couldn't see them until finally I went, oh, you mean those big gray boulders there, the ones that are moving. <laughs> and yeah, so that was just quite embarrassing. And it took a little while, you know, I was very quiet after that. <laughs> because, you know, rhinos are kind of big uh, and kind of obvious. But I realized I had only ever seen a rhino in a zoo. I didn't know what they looked like in the wild. The next day we went looking for rhinos again. And by the end of the day, I was almost as good as the trackers at spotting the rhinos because I had changed my 
mental picture of what a rhino looks like. And that's what I'm hoping to do here today, is change your picture, your mental picture of water. I want to help you gain what I'm going to call water vision, to see all of the water that's around us, all the water that it takes to make everything we have in our lives, from our food to our clothes, to our electronics, to our electricity. So that's what I'm hoping my book will do, and I'm hoping that's what we can get into today. So, demonstration time. It's a beautiful place, and of course, it's mostly water, right? Most of our planet is covered in water. 70% of the surface is water. Most of it, of course, is oceans, right? But 97% is seawater. The other 3% is fresh water. Now, where is most of that fresh water? Well, it's locked up in the polar ice caps, Greenland. You can see all the big ice on the top there. Uh, Antarctica, glaciers on mountains. Uh, permafrost throughout the northern hemisphere, so underground. And of course there's aquifers. Many of the aquifers, the underground water sources, are actually uh, either too remote or uh, too saline or salty for use uh, as fresh water. Um, as, I, as Stephen also alluded to, yes, the book has a lot of numbers and I am not going to be able to remember all the specifics, but in there it talks about what percentage of the the rivers and lakes of the world. It's a very tiny percent, even though they've got the gigantic Great Lakes uh, right next door. It's actually a very tiny percentage of the amount of water. Um, so in the end, the amount of water we have available for human use, fresh water, is very, very small. And I'm going to do a, hopefully not a messy demonstration here. So let's say this is all the water in the planet. So the first bits, of course, is all salt water, salt water, salt water, salt water. I actually didn't measure the glass, so I'm not sure. So let's say that's uh, some fresh water. I might have to drink some. Uh, <coughs> so, okay, ice caps coming in now, the glaciers, groundwater that we can't use, uh, saline aquifers, uh, water that's just too far away for human use, and uh, the little bits, of, little bits of water that are left, these little last drops, there's all the water we have. I actually worked this out in the, in the book, uh, using liters and all that stuff. So it's actually, it liter literally works out to one liter jug, in one liter jug, one drop of water is all the fresh water that we have as a, as a ratio. So it's not nearly as much water as we think. So where does all the water go that we use? I mentioned 2,100 uh, gallons a day. So that's the typical uh, daily household use is about 100 gallons, 80 to 100 gallons. <laughs> the toilet is one of the big users. Uh, this is an average breakdown of where water goes, how we use it within our house. So this is what the water we see. So we call this the direct water use. So this is water we see. Um, the other 2,000 gallons I'm going to talk about is the water we don't see, the indirect or virtual water it's also called. So I broke it down into this little graph, converted it into gallons. Um, so you can see the water we use in the house on your right, and the virtual water or the indirect water use for all the stuff we have. And this is daily per person water consumption. 2,000 gallons is pretty heavy. If you had to carry it, it's like pushing two or three cars. Um, so, let's get into the actual water footprints. So that's what it's called. Water footprints is a term used to describe how much water it takes to make something. So we're going to take, well, this is 16 ounces, so it's close enough. So 46 gallons for cola. So what's cola made of? Well, it's mostly sugar, so sugar water. Where does sugar come from? And this is how I worked this out. Sugar comes from corn, it comes from sugar beets, it comes, can come sometimes from cane. So worked out how much sugar goes into that, how much water does it take to grow the plant to make the sugar. 
Um, in the case of uh, cola, I think it's about uh, eight gallons. So not that much, but the big part of uh, the water footprint for cola is uh, the flavors that are in there. So it has um, vanilla. So vanilla is a tropical plant, also takes uh, a lot of water to grow. It takes a lot of water to process vanilla to turn it into something you can use as a flavor enhancer. And uh, cola also contains caffeine. Caffeine comes from coffee plants. Coffee plants, uh, also a tropical plant that needs a lot of water. The, uh, there's some water usage in terms of the processing and the shipping. And this little uh, plastic water bottle also takes water to make. Um, so it takes roughly five of these worth of water to make one of these plastic containers. Yes, and that doesn't include the water that's in there. So th uh, what's plastic made of? Plastic is made of oil. You need, oil, you need water to get oil out of the ground. You need water to process oil uh, and make plastic. Cup of coffee, again, tropical plant, takes a lot of water to grow, 37 gallons. Tea is uh, a, a more water efficient. Uh, it takes a little bit less. I get a, um, my cheat sheet, nine gallons, so quite a bit uh, different. Then the numbers get really big when you get into meat because the meat's a very water intensive um, way to produce food. The cow, well, you could say it drinks a lot. It's not that, it's not the drinking, it's the food it eats. So it eats tons and tons of grains, which require water to grow. So you work out how much they eat and how much it takes, how much water it takes to grow. You can figure out um, how much water ends up being in a, well, what is basically a medium-sized hamburger. Um, by contrast, if you had a soy burger, it's only 66 gallons. Um, so there's like a, a 10 to 1 ratio. So for a calorie of meat, it takes 10 times as much water as it does for a calorie of uh, veg uh, vegetarian product. Obviously, everything takes water. Uh, before I continue on, I should mention quickly about the meat and sustainability. This comes up a lot. So just back to the, oh, backwards. That uh, just because it takes a lot of water doesn't always mean it's unsustainable. So if you have grass-fed beef, for instance, not using fertilizers or um, any other stuff, you're not sending them off to feedlots, so there isn't any water pollution and there isn't any uh, taking water out of the ground. You just use rain. Then you could argue that's a sustainable production of a, a food from a water perspective. So, uh, so even though it takes a lot of water, you could argue about is this the best way to use our limited water resources? Well, that's a different uh, discussion, but uh, certainly it can be from a uh, point of view of sustainability. So one of the things to remember in all these big numbers is this is water that can't be used for something else. So these numbers are net numbers. These are not numbers. These are the water I'm talking about here isn't being reused, can't be reused. So we already eliminated that part. Sometimes you can reuse water, you can clean it. But in all cases, these are the net numbers. So you've got uh, your rice, fair amount of water. Well, what happened to the water? Well, okay, a lot of the water goes into the ground. Some of the water is actually in the plant. Most of the water evaporates. It evaporates and goes someplace else. So effectively, you can't use that water again on that particular piece of ground, uh, ground because it's evaporated or it's in the soil. We can't reuse it that way. It's part of the water cycle. It goes someplace else, so those little molecules uh, are, have gone elsewhere. Um, so that's why these are net numbers, not uh, gross numbers. Cotton is grown usually in very dry places. It uses a lot of water for uh, keeping the plants going. Processing uses a lot of water because there's lots of dyes involved, the softening of the fabric, um, and so on. So it's one of the bigger uses. You know, so we're all wearing probably 10,000 
uh, well, a liter, so three or four th thousand gallons of water. Cell phones, like any product, requires water. This one's, of course, much more difficult to uh, figure out because cell phones are made up of so many different parts. Glass, plastic, uh, metals. Metals require water for um, getting out of the ground as well as refining. So wherever you turn, you can see there's water being used and generally large volumes of water. Um, and you can, if you've got the resources, you can figure out pretty well how much water it takes to do many, uh, to almost anything. Uh, and they're always, always more water than you'd ever expect. Uh, I recently had a grandchild, so this is why this is more relevant to me. Um, this is an example of reuse, so, you know, and the, the whole debate. debate. Uh, so there's a remarkable difference in the amount of water involved uh, in uh, uh, reusing diapers versus a disposable. This probably applies to most disposable products. Uh, because it takes a lot to make anything. So I calculated out how much water it takes to wash a bunch of diapers and to come up with this particular uh, statistic. Now, uh, disposable, disposable diapers are made of wood products, wood fibers, plastics, a bunch of stuff. And that's why it's a pretty high number. But uh, cotton, of course, is quite large as well. But because you reuse it, say 50 times is what I use as the baseline, which isn't exactly a lot, uh, but I think uh, a reasonable number. That means that uh, you get a bunch of better uh, value uh, in terms of the water consumption. So just to recap, we've got water that we know about, the one we see, and then the, the hidden water, the water that we use uh, but without knowing that we're using water. So why, so let's talk a bit more about food. So yeah, obviously all food products uh, require water. Some require a little bit more. Avocados get a lot of wrap because they need a lot of water. Now very often um, it's growing things in the wrong place that creates these larger water uh, footprints. Uh, so California being an example of the avocado problem, it's because most of California is a desert. So maybe you shouldn't be growing fruits that need tropical rainfall you know, levels of water in a desert. Uh, California does a lot of things kind of along those lines. They grow rice. Uh, it's the largest dairy uh, producer in the US. Uh, dairy cows need a lot of water. They need a lot of food. Uh, you know, Wisconsin is not the, the dairy, dairy state, really, uh, although it should be because it's much wetter. It has much better water resources than California does. Um, uh, processing takes a little bit more as well. So big difference for uh, just a regular bottle of ketchup, 140 gallons. Um, one thing I wanted to also mention is that there's a growing things in the wrong place thing, which is part of our global trade system. So oranges, for instance, are not just grown in Florida. Uh, they're grown in really dry places like Egypt. So most of Europe gets their oranges from Egypt, which is, again, all desert. Uh, and they use the water from the Nile to irrigate. And all of those oranges are exported, so it's 80 liters of water, so that's like 20 gallons um, for each orange. So all that water is being shipped from a very dry country to wetter countries up in Europe, which doesn't make sense. Uh, there's a lot of things like that in the global food trade that don't make sense. So this is just another one. This is the, the water thing that doesn't make any sense in the global food trade. Um, again, beef. So that's for 200 kilograms or 400 pounds of beef. You know, 3 million, or 820,000 gallons. Again, it's the food they eat that's the biggest. So the... Um, most animals are not that efficient in processing the food that they eat. Um, and then there's all sorts of problems with the kinds of foods that we're feeding them. Uh, just, just to give an example of different types of meats, there is lower uh, chicken being the lowest of all the meats. Uh, so chickens, God love them, are efficient little uh, grain eaters. Although, mind you, chickens would rather eat insects and bugs than grain. 
Um, so if you've ever seen free-range chickens on fresh on a fresh piece of grass, they go crazy for bugs, insects, worms. Um, they'll also eat meat, too, if you give them a chance. Um, so yes, if you're going to have uh, meat and you're concerned about water usage, uh, chicken is the better way to go. So looking at uh, various diets, a meat-based diet is a lot more water intensive than a vegetarian diet. So you can save 250,000 gallons a year yourself just by switching from meat to a vegetarian diet. I think that's a, you know, enormous uh, savings in terms of water and in terms of water resources, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So that's the uh, water scarcity map, the global map. So there isn't too many places that are in the green. So this is the, um, an estimate of how much water uh, resources people have over an entire year. And for most of the world, there are months there is a month or many months where they don't have enough water. And that includes the U.S. So large parts of the U.S. Uh, in the last few years especially have had not enough water during the summer or have had to have restrictions or have had drought problems. And even in Canada last year, the last three years actually, also just like California, so Canada's west coast, which is known as the wet coast because it's north of uh, Washington state, so it seems to me it rains there all the time every time I go there, but they've had uh, droughts and water rationing. Uh, you know, this is where Canada has its rainforest. Uh, um, and that's just been unprecedented. A lot of that has to do with uh, climate change. 